those songs this morning. Yes. What a blessing. Yes. You brought your Bibles. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the New Testament toward the end of your Bible. We're going past Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and you'll come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And when you find your place, if you'll stand as we reverence the reading of God's Word together, if you're able, I'd like to begin reading in verse number 1. Please pray this morning that God would speak or He would have spoken to you today. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain that even after that we had suffered before we were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which try our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, we exhort, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father to his children, that you would walk worthy of God who had called you unto his kingdom and glory. I want to go back and look at verse number seven. That's where we'll be taking special focus this morning. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word and the reading of it. Have thine own way, God, and give the increase now as you see fit, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. You may be seated in the presence of God this morning. The context of these verses is Paul reminding the Thessalonian church how he had served with them served them and labored alongside them for a number of months. He's saying this to remind them of their knowledge of his loving care and affection for them as members of the body of Christ. This is what we see in verse number 7 where Paul uses the word trophos, which the King James translates as nurse. And that word has in view a nourisher, someone who gives nourishment. If you study New Testament Greek and early Christian literature, and I'll cite the Bauer, Art Gingrich, and Danker lexicon for this because I'm not a Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but what you'll discover is that this word was widely used by the church fathers. It was used in the Septuagint. It was used by Josephus and, and Philo, and I'll even throw Homer in there. And you'll also discover that the most common meaning of the word was nurse. Some of the modern translations throw the word mother in there, and I wouldn't say that's wrong at all. But the King James was right with nerves. And I have little doubt that each person here today has witnessed at least one scene inside of your life where a tender, nursing woman was gently and lovingly caring for a helpless, precious baby. And the scriptures tell us that the Apostle Paul was also familiar with with such a scene, and we know this because he employed the imagery of a nursing woman in 1 Thessalonians when he told the Thessalonian church that they, being Paul and Silas and Timothy, they had proven to be gentle among them, even as a nurse. 
cherishes her children. So consider for a, mo a moment the heartfelt love that a nurse has for her baby. That baby can't give any clear reciprocation of that love. That baby can't speak up and say to the nursing woman, you know, I surely do appreciate all that you're doing for me. Thank you for everything that you do for me. Thank you for all the tender, loving care. I really appreciate it. And by the way, I love you too. The baby can't say that. That baby can't do much of anything to show any real, visible return of love and affection to the nurse. Yet what does the good nurse do? She continues to love the baby and nurture the baby and feed the baby and care for the baby and watch the baby and protect the baby and think of the baby and thank God for the baby. This is the imagery that Paul uses to describe how God's servants should relate to the flock. Ministers should have such a caring love and affection for the congregation that it drives them to impart the gospel of Jesus Christ and to give of themselves every aspect of their lives because they have such a great care, a great love, and a great concern for the people. The man of God sees the congregation as dear to him, not just as a, a group, but as individuals. This love and care and concern will be there, whether it comes back or not, whether it's reciprocated or not. The cherishing of the flock is going to be present there regardless. So the tender, loving, caring, and affectionate nurse is not seen in this passage trying to command the child around. She's not seen trying to lord it over the baby. The church is a family, yes, and there is clear authority of God's preachers spoken of in the scripture. We see it in just a few verses down in verse number 11 with the exhorting and the comforting. It. And Paul is charging them all in verse number 11 as a father doeth his children. And to that we say yes. And to that we say amen. But both dynamics are present in the scripture. The authority and the nurturing are both clearly taught as duties of God's servants. This is the heart of Paul in this passage of scripture. In verse number 7, he's telling the Thessalonians here, when we were with you, we were among you as gentle, as a nurse, cherishing her baby. And then in verse number 11, he goes on and says, we were also there charging and exhorting you as, as a father. We entreated you as a gentle nurse treats her children, but we also related to you as a father to his children. And these are people who had every right, according to the word of God, to act with authority. Especially Paul, who was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, we see them acting with great tenderness toward the Thessalonians. And it's in this tenderness that we see a picture of the gracious dealings of God toward sinners through the gospel. The apostle Paul was a man who met people where they were. If they were intellectuals, if they were great philosophers, he engaged them on that level. If they were prison guards, soldiers, children, people down at the marketplace, it didn't matter to him. He engaged them on that level. He bent himself to their capacity, and he became all things unto all men. And if I could say anything of certainty today, I could say this. I thank God for his gracious dealings toward this sin. I thank God for his gracious dealings, his gracious work in the life of my rebellious heart that brought me up out of the darkness and, and, and into the light and translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. The word of God came to me with power. Paul knew that the word of God comes with power. I remember how it struck me as a lost and a rebellious man. I was lost and the word of God came to me with great conviction. It came into co conflict with my carnal mind. It came into conflict with this flesh. And it came with great authority unlike anything that I've never, ever known or experienced in my life. There's more power in God's word than anything we'll ever know. There's more than enough power to change that rebellious heart. God's word is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. But I've met some folks who seem to believe that they can add some power to God's word by adding their own stringency to it. They try to add their own harshness to the word of God when God's word does not need us uh, to give it a little boost. God's word does not need us to add a little pizzazz to it. 
And when that lost and rebellious sinner are, are under conviction, God's word is more than strong enough to convince them of their depravity and their need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And yes, any good nurse will take a hard stand when necessary for the child's good because she loves and cares for and cherishes the child. That's the way God's ministers should be towards uh, God's people. And I say, God, give us the grace to be like this. God, help us to be this kind of people, to cherish the flock and to nurture the flock and to protect the flock and to love the flock at all times. This is God's will for his ministers according to the scripture that every Christian would do well to pray for God's ministers that they would fall in line with the word of God, that they would conform themselves to God's standards and being gentle among the flock and cherishing the flock is all part of it. We need to preach hard. We need to preach with zeal. We need to preach in truth and, and with passion and with fervor and in the power and the demonstration of the spirit of God. But we need to cherish the flock and nourish the flock as the gentle nurse cherishes the child. And we need your prayers that we may be this kind of people. Now, why should this matter to you? You, you say, Pastor Byrne, why does this relate to me? I'm not a pastor. I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a church leader. Well, it should matter to you because we all need to know how the Bible calls us to relate to one another or else we'll wind up somewhere settling for something other than what God has ordained for our own spiritual nourishment. Amen. And if that were to happen because we don't understand what the book says, not only will you possibly wind up being mistreated, but it won't be honoring to the Lord. And for people who are saved, honoring the Lord is a top priority Amen. in your life. Ask yourself this, friends. Am I a person who lives a life that honors the Lord? Or do I honor myself? Do I honor this sinful world? We need to be a people who honor God. And Jesus can transform you into that kind of person if you'll turn to him in faith and repentance. In verse number 7, we see this little three-letter word, but. But. We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. You know, that little word, but, is far much more powerful than we often seem to realize. Mm -hmm. It is, in the Greek, it, it represents a very sharp contrast. But, and part of the purpose of Paul in writing to the Thessalonians, just to give you a little bit more background, is because he was under attack. There were some enemies out there who were spreading false information about Paul, trying to make him look like a false apostle. So he comes to defend his ministry, but he's not defending just for the sake of his own reputation. He's defending because it's linked directly to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some folks were saying some things about Paul that weren't true. So Paul is clearing the air, and he's reminding the Thessalonians of things that they already know because they've seen it with their own eyes. They've experienced this. Paul was among them. He's telling these Thessalonians, when you all first met us, you didn't really know us. You didn't know what kind of men we were. You didn't know anything about us. You didn't know our demeanors. You didn't know how we conduct ourselves. You knew none of this. But over a span of time, we proved ourselves to be gentle. Among you. As the gentle nurse who cherishes her children. He's saying, you know this because you watched our lives. And it was demonstrated right in front of you. We were gentle. Before the Lord saved me and made me a new creature. I'm here to tell you this morning. I could make no claims to gentleness. Whatsoever. I remember a few times in my early 20s that I would run to people hoping that they'd try to fight with me. I was not born with the inclination toward gentleness. But I'm here to tell you this morning that even the roughest, meanest, hardest, most vile people among us, they can become gentle Amen. in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Some of you have heard me speak about my friend Daryl who passed away a few months ago. He was one of the hardest men 
that I ever knew. I know Melissa's heard so much about Daryl over the years. And he was this, this tough, big, mean-looking man. And I would always say, I'd come home from work sometimes, and I'd talk to my wife, and I'd say, you know, if the Lord would save Daryl, what a testimony he would have. And I long to see a change in him, the kind of radical change that only the Lord Jesus Christ could make. And thankfully, the Lord allowed me to see that for just a short time before he passed away. And I was blessed with an opportunity to talk to Daryl about the Lord and hear him tell me that he'd gotten right with God and that he knew that Jesus Christ was the only way and the Lord allowed me to pray with him several times before he passed away and I got to see that big, mean, tough, mean-looking man become gentle. And yes, in the last year of his life, he was sick in body, but I'm not talking about that. I'm not telling you that he was gentle because he was sick and he wasn't able to be mean because I've seen people on their deathbeds that just were just as mean and vile and wicked as they ever were. No, he became gentle. The same one who made Daryl gentle is the same one who made Paul gentle. And this is how God's servant should be. And I'm not saying that if they have a bad day that they're not fit to serve the Lord. I'm saying that there is a quality of gentleness here that ought to characterize the lives of God's servants. So here in this passage of Scripture, uh, Paul is saying, you saw our lives. You have firsthand knowledge. You know that we were gentle among you. But you know Paul needed Jesus to make him that way. We're talking about a man who before his conversion to Christ, the Bible said when they stoned Stephen to death back in Acts chapter 7 that Paul was the one that they came and they laid their garments at his feet. Now you can read about that in Acts chapter 7. In order to stone Stephen to death more easily, the men would take off their upper garments and they laid them before Saul of Tarsus, who we know was Paul, and that means that Paul was the one who cared for the garments of the men who stoned Stephen to death. He was not gentle. He was not a gentle man. He was fierce. He was fierce concerning the law of God. He was fierce about rounding the Christian believers up to be put in prison or even put to death in some cases. But in Christ he became gentle. Paul is a great example that nobody is impossible for God to reach and nobody is impossible for God to change to our way of thinking. We might look at this and we might look at the life of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and we might say that man died prematurely. He was so gifted as a man of God. He was such a powerful preacher. The Bible said he was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, but yet he preached one sermon and his life ended. But how could we really consider this any kind of waste knowing that there was a young man named Saul who stood there in the crowd? Saul was not only a witness to the quality of Stephen's life, but he was also one of the targets of Stephen's dying prayer. Amen. Amen. So Stephen didn't have a very long ministry upon this earth, but he had a powerful one. It was a powerful ministry. It was full of purpose. And some car carnally minded people today will try to say that a local church must be doing something wrong because there's not a great big giant crowd of people showing up on Sunday morning. But I'm here to tell you this morning, my dear friend, that a great big giant crowd of people is no more an indicator that the church is doing right or wrong than the length of Stephen's ministry was an indicator to the power of his ministry. Amen. Amen. So Jesus Christ... God's servants become gentle. Paul became gentle. He wasn't gentle only among believers. He was gentle among the unbelievers also. Christ made him gentle toward all people. I don't mean pacifism, but being gentle as in loving and cherishing and caring for people. A servant of God who is gentle means that they don't fly off the handle and bow up with anger every time somebody doesn't act the way that you think they ought to act. But what I find remarkable here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 7 is that it's not just Paul who was gentle. He says, but we 
were gentle among you. So not only had Christ made Paul gentle, but the same Christ also made Silas and Timothy gentle. And friends, I find it a comfort and an encouragement to my heart today to know that the transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ is efficacious, it's effective unto all who come to Him by faith. When you meet the true Jesus of the Bible and not some make-believe Jesus, you will be changed. You will not remain the same. He will change you. And that change will manifest itself in a love for God and a love for fellowship with God's people and a love for serving God and not the flesh and so much more. To you ladies who are here this morning, let this imagery of gentleness be a special encouragement to you today. Many societies and many cultures, and I'm well aware, many false churches have downplayed the importance of women, and they've taken women, and they've marginalized them and relegated them off to the sidelines, and it ought not so to be. We need to build women up. We need to encourage our women. There is a movement out there today that labels itself as feminism, and that is an anti-God, anti-gospel movement. They seek to overthrow the word of the Lord and blur the biblical distinctions. And they disregard what God has said about the roles of men and women. And they say that God is against women. They say that God hates women. They say that the Bible is against women. The truth is, God thinks so highly of women that he uses this example of a nursing woman cherishing a child to illustrate how his ministers should treat the flock of God. God has roles for men and women, yes. Men and women have different responsibilities within the family and within the church, but you'll never convince me that God hates women. You'll never convince me that my God has no concern for women. Let me give you a couple of quick applications before I come to a close this morning. To our pastors, and our preachers, and our church leaders. And this is going out online. We have no way of knowing where God will send this and who will watch this before it's all said and done. But to all of you, always remember, and I was talking to a local pastor just the other day about this very same thing. There is much, much more to serving God than just preaching sermons. Always remember this. The Apostle Paul, he was there. That's what the scripture says. He was among them. He was there. He bore with the people. With all of his intellect and with all of his knowledge of the law. He didn't try to segregate himself away from the flock of God. He said we were there among you. And we were gentle. What do you need to do to be gentle among God's people? What do you need to do to cherish them as the nurse cherishes her children? Who can you visit? What need can you meet? Who can you talk to? Who can you listen to that God's children will see and know that you are there and you are gentle? To all of our women who are here this morning, know that God has a special care for you. Know that you have value and you have worth and you have dignity that's been given to you by the Lord. He's the one who gave it to you. God thinks so highly of women that he used the imagery of Christ loving his church so much as to die for it to teach us men how we ought to treat our wives. Don't ever let this world tell you don't ever let the devil try to convince you that God has no regard for you. That is a lie. When it comes to being created in the image of God, women and men are equal. When it comes to having saving union with Christ, women and men are equal. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus and if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
to all of us. Let us fervently pray for each other that we would ever live as God's people who glorify God in the way that we relate to one another. You may not be a pastor. You may not be a preacher. You may not be a church leader. But you can pray for those who are. That they'll be gentle among God's people. And I can tell you firsthand, we need those prayers. We need those prayers. We need you to pray. You can also pray for our women that they would be encouraged by the scriptures we read today. Encouraged to walk on with the Lord in the midst of this sinful world that we live in in 2022. And you can take what's been preached today and share it with somebody else who may be going through a battle. They may be going through an adversity. They may be going through a trial. And maybe they need to hear it. Maybe it'll be a help to them. And let us also be a people who will uphold the Bible's standards in every area that we face in this life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've given to us in your word. Thank you, God, for what you revealed to us regarding your son and how we are to relate to one another in light of him. And I pray, Lord, that we would fully understand and grasp not only your word, but that we would ever see Christ above all things. Help us, Father, to see Christ as you see him. And help us to glory in him as all of heaven does this day. We ask this prayer in the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you all as we stand this morning in the house of God. to live. 